We've defined scatter and cross-section, and we've defined the partial waves and described how that can be used to help arrive at a conclusion about the scatter and cross-section. But you can see that scattering is a messy business, and approximations are always going to be helpful. And today, it's the Born approximation. Here's our scattering problem. You have a plane wave incident on a scattering target. This is the scattering target. And after the scattering, some of the plane wave continues unscattered, and you create some spherical wave. And our main concern is with the spherical wave. Because they're waves, they're described by a wave equation, the Schrodinger wave equation to be precise. And in three dimensions, it has the Laplacian operator as the derivative. The other terms are the same, as you normally see in a Schrodinger equation. Mu is the reduced mass. In the event that the incident wave represents a particle of mass m1, and the target represents a particle of mass m2, then the reduced mass is given by a simple expression. In the event that the target is much more massive than the incident particle, the reduced mass is simply the mass of the incident particle. Energy is the energy of the scattered wave if we want to be looking at the scattered wave. In any event, it's h bar squared k squared over 2m, where k is the wave number. I've sketched these cartoonish waves, incident and scattered, in such a way that it should be clear that what does not change in the scattering event is the wavelength. So k's magnitude is the same for the incident wave and the scattered wave. The only thing that changes is the direction. Using this expression for energy, the Schrodinger equation looks a little bit different. Or because the target and the wave form a system, I'll use the reduced mass in the energy calculation. Grouping all of the constants into one term, there's an even neater expression. I have on the left side a homogeneous second order differential equation that you already know the solution to. For k0 just means the incident wave number. The right hand side corresponds to a particular solution. And that's where we're going to devote our attention right now to what that particular solution will be. I'm going to bring in a somewhat abstract mathematical concept called the Green function, Green's function depending on your preference. I don't know what the particular solution looks like, but I do know that it can be equivalently depicted as an integral of this potential. I'll create a dummy variable r to write in there and integrate over. But it's probably not quite that simple. I will add a function g in order to have a solution of, of this integral that actually has r in it, because I'm going to integrate over a dummy r, and so I have to multiply it by some function that includes r. This function is called the Green's function, and we know a little bit about it. I'll put it over here. What we're not going to do is develop Green's functions in this uh, lecture. I'm going to give you the result. s is another dummy variable. Where k is the wave number of the scattered wave, which for now we're going to keep it indicated differently, even though wavelength doesn't change, the lambda doesn't change, but we do know that vector direction will change, and so for now I'm going to drag through k and k0 as separate entities. d cubed s is just a volume element, the, the standard spherical coordinate three-dimensional so I'm going to put this differential element into the integral and actually write down a solution. Not that I've derived, but just a solution. So here we go on to the next slide. That looks funny, but the 2 pi in the numerator is the phi integral because there is no phi dependence in scattering. We're going to skip the steps in between this and the solution because it involves a contour integral. We're not all ready to use contour integration. So this is where at our point I'm going to give you a solution. It 
and this is equation 1065 in Griffiths. We're not at a point yet where we can really seriously treat Green's functions, but it's really important, I think, that you are aware that there's such a thing out there that shows up in the particular solutions of inhomogeneous differential equations. You're going to encounter it in later studies at higher levels with electromagnetism and quantum mechanics. Be prepared for at least having it thrown at you only in the future, you, you may want to be a little bit familiar with contour integrals in order to uh, follow the solution. By the way, this first part here is equation 1058 in Griffiths. The solution then is a plane wave. This is your incident wave. It has not changed direction. You've got the minus sign here. That's that minus sign. You may want to flip back a slide and see what motivates having h bar squared in the denominator, what motivates having mu in the numerator. We'll call that equation one. This can be solved with the Born approximation, which is a method of successive approximations. That means you need to have a starting point, an assumption about the wave function. And the first assumption, which is referred to as a zeroth order Born approximation, is to approximate the wave function as the incident wave. That is, the scattered wave is a plane wave. So if we make that assumption, I'll call it psi sub zero for the zeroth order. So what came in went out. That's the first order, and it's obviously wrong. But you see, then you use this. Take this plane wave, put it inside this integral, and solve and get a new wave function. And that will be your first order Born approximation. So you see the successive approximations here. I'm going to write R1 instead of R prime, only to indicate that right now I'm in the midst of the first order Born approximation, but it has the same meaning. It is a dummy variable of integration. Important factors inside this integral include the first one. You recognize that that's a spherical wave. This is our scattered wave. There's a potential that is inciting the scattering. And then there's the incident wave. You can substitute this back into the integral in equation 1 up here. You can take this whole mess, put it in for psi in equation 1, and have the second order Born approximation. And that gets done. We're not going to do that. We're going to stop at the first order Born approximation. I'm going to call this equation 2. In scattering, usually now we take r to be large, which really simplifies a lot of things. That large r means that this 1 over magnitude of r minus r1 can be approximately written as 1 over r. That's going to be very helpful, don't you think? Allowing this to be rewritten as where I brought the k inside the magnitude sign which means it goes in as a vector and has to be dotted with those r vectors. I just want you to realize that these two portions of the expression are identical. k times the magnitude of r minus r1 and magnitude of k dot r minus k dot r1. Apparently I've reverted back to using r prime. It's just a dummy variable name, so it really doesn't matter. Let's talk a little bit about this exponential. I need to stop having an absolute value up there because it's it's confusing and, and hard to manage. So let's make an approximation here. I'm going to sketch it over here. If I have this vector r prime, and I have a vector r, and remember in scattering, r is big, then I have a vector that connects them. Not a very straight line there, but that's r minus r prime. I can approximate this k times r minus r prime as k times r minus the projection of k onto r prime. That's believable without proof, I think, on account of the fact that k and r are in the same direction. So k dot r 
is kr. They're in the same direction, and k is the wave vector, the scattered wave. And so that's what's going to go in the exponential instead of what I had up here or there. Rewriting it with that little change, we have psi of r. I can pull the e to the i k r out of the integral. For now, I will leave the minus sign awkwardly positioned in those square brackets. Because r prime is the variable of integration, I cannot pull that factor out of the integral. I'm going to actually go out of my way here and put a subscript i and c on that psi to remind ourselves this is literally the incident wave. I'd suggest you compare this to equation 1012 in Griffiths. When you do that, it becomes clear that what's inside the square brackets is f of theta in that equation. I'll write this in some more compact direct notation where the scattered wave is at this point now just e to the minus i k dot r prime. That's how it's typically written. You see the e to the i k r that was pulled out is the part of the incident wave that did not scatter. So now we have a way to get the scattering cross-section. Remember the differential scattering cross-section. which is the derivative of the total scattering cross-section sigma with the solid angle, is the modulus squared of f. Here then is another way of declaring the first Born approximation. The potential energy V of r is weak enough it should be weak enough because because in scattering you do stay a large r away from the scattering target almost all the time. So v of r is weak enough that the scattered wave is also a plane wave. In that case we'll leave f of theta perhaps written in this practical form. where this A that I had written at the top of the screen is, let's just absorb that into V. Put those exponentials together. And I'll take the difference in the K vectors to be something called Q. which provides an alternative, simpler and cleaner way to look at the differential scattering cross-section. Well, it's a useful expression, but how do you use it? Well, it's easiest to talk about it in the context of elastic scattering. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here and talk about elastic scattering. What that is, is the case where k vector does not change magnitude. k has the same magnitude as k0. The only thing that changes is direction. So let's draw a picture of that. If the angle between k and k0 is theta, and this dashed line is a bisector, then this is that angle theta divided by 2. And this distance right here is k times sine of theta over 2. So I think I'm ready to say what the difference between those k vectors are. k minus k0 magnitude, which is q, equals 2k, twice that length, 2k sine of half theta. So the magnitude of q is 2k sine of theta over 2. There's also the exponential, which has q dot r prime in it. And for that, we'll need another dummy variable. q dot r prime, you know, of course, is q times r prime times cosine of the angle between them. So we'll call theta prime the angle between q vector and r prime vector. And now let's rewrite f of theta. 
we will make the triple integral obvious for ourselves. Put the limits on there. Of course, the phi integral is just 2 pi, but the theta integral is going to take some work. I will evaluate that phi integral, and the 2 pi then is gone. I factor out the r parts and first do the theta integral. This can be achieved with a u sub. Let u be the cosine of theta prime. That way du is minus sine of theta prime d theta prime. I rewrite the limits when theta equals 0, u equals 1, and when theta equals pi, u equals minus 1, and just solve the integral, and put that in. And that's for elastic scattering. Elastic scattering is the case where there's no energy dissipated. So when two charges scatter off of each other, it's elastic scattering. An example of inelastic scattering would be when energy is absorbed. So if the incoming particle has a certain amount of energy, and during the scattering process, some of that energy is transferred to the target and puts the target into an excited state, that would be inelastic scattering. We can write a differential scattering cross-section with that expression for F. And let's apply this to electrostatic scattering. It's called Rutherford scattering. That's when the potential energy is the electrostatic potential energy of a point charge, where the point charge has, say, a charge of Z1 times E. The incident wave has a charge of Z2 times E. I think what I'm getting at here is the incident wave is some charged particle, perhaps an alpha particle with z equal to 2, or perhaps a proton with z equal to 1, or an electron with z equal to 1. And the target is a nucleus with its own z. For now, we'll just consider a positive incoming. Otherwise, if it were an incoming electron, you would need to put a minus sign in front. Let's write all that stuff only. Now, this is v of r which is going to simplify that integral quite a bit. You see, so that r is going to cancel. The curious thing about this integral is it's not zero. Normally, you say if you integrate sine over over all space, I'm going to get zero, but we're integrating sine over half space. And we won't get zero because sine is an odd function and we're integrating it over half space. Uh, it turns out that this integral, rather than equaling zero, equals one over q. So it's q to the fourth, because we have to bring in an extra 1 over q squared to multiply that 1 over q squared. Remember what we decided our expression for q can be, 2k sine of half a theta. Let's use that. So I have k to the fourth, because q is 2k sine of half theta. Put my 4 pi epsilon naught out there. Now I have k in here, and I'm not so comfortable with k. It's not the most practical quantity, especially in an experiment. You like energy. We, turn, we, we tune a beam to a certain energy. We want to use that. Well, so replace k with e using energy is h bar squared k squared over 2 mass. 
Let's do it that way. Energy is h bar squared k squared over twice the mass. That's the Rutherford Differential Scattering Cross-Section. I think an example is in order. Let's set up an experiment with scattering where we have an alpha particle at an energy of 8 mega electron volts. So I'll describe the alpha particle this way. Doubly ionized helium nucleus, although in a lot of experiments it's singly ionized. So Z1 is 2, and it hits a target which might be a very large nucleus left compared to an alpha particle, say gold. Well, Z2 is 79. It's large enough that I am, in this treatment, going to neglect the recoil of the gold. Normally you wouldn't because it's not insignificant completely, but we're going to uh, take, not have that in our consideration because that would add additional analysis. So there's a trajectory of the alpha particle. It hits the gold and it scatters at some angle, which I'll say in this example is 60 degrees. And then out here is a detector. Let's sketch that function d sigma by d omega that we just came up with. Now I can imagine an angle anywhere between 0 and 180 degrees. If you look at that expression, it has sine to the fourth of theta over 2 in the denominator, so it's quite large at theta equals 0. It doesn't go to 0. I mean, at, at 180 degrees, sine of theta over 2 is 1. It levels off at some value. Beyond theta equals 180 degrees, we won't consider the value. But it looks like that. Theta is 60 degrees meaning theta divided by 2 is 30 degrees, although that may not be obvious because we have two frames, a lab frame and a center of mass frame, and we should really be using the center of mass frame. But when the heavier object doesn't move on collision, those, those are one and the same. When m1 is very small, then that's, they're approximately the same center of mass. So that was just to uh, cover a uh, dot. That was to dot an I or cross a T just to make that statement. Let's go ahead and get a number. So we have our Z's. One of them is 2 and one of them is 79. You have E to the fourth. I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to write it as E squared times 1.6 times 10 minus 19 squared. And you might ask, well, why are you doing that? Because we're given the energy in electron volts. And I'll just keep writing it that way. So just cancel the E squareds. And I'll use 9 times 10 to the 9th for 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. It's actually 8.998 times 10 to the 9th, I think. It's very, very close to 9 units of voltmeter per coulomb so you can check your units quickly and see they they cancel out and you're just left with area I will leave one digit and the reason for only leaving one digit is there were a lot of approximations here the Born approximation to begin with the center of mass equal lab frame approximation that is 8 times 10 to the minus 10 square nanometers. I'll leave it up to you to put it in the barns. So the size of the target that you need in order to scatter at 60 degrees is 8 times 10 minus 10 nanometers. And that's Rutherford scattering. We use that experimentally a lot, especially in material characterization in the ion beam analysis lab. And that's our illustration of the Born approximation. The Rutherford scattering cross-section was derived 
using the Born approximation, and it is a very commonly used expression, that expression of d sigma by d omega that we just used. Okay, we'll stop with that, and next time return to time-dependent perturbation theory.